Hey, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Hey, who had a, an amazing time last week singing in this room? Anybody? Anybody? Just me? All right. All four of us. Perfect. Well, you four that brought so much energy last time, would you please join me again? I loved the, the, the feeling of being in this room. Nothing louder than the actual voices of people raising their praise to God. It was so, so great. What I love about this kind of room, um, it brings us all together. We're in here close, nice and tight. And the one thing that brings us together is not our socioeconomic status. It is not um, our upbringing. It is not where we're from. It is the fact that we share a common story and that God found us when we were dead in our trespasses and he made us alive together in Christ. So we're going to stand together and we're going to sing about that. And I don't think you'll need any help drowning me out this morning, but just in case. Are we all in this together this morning? Are you going to sing with me? All right. Sing it. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Until I met you And I was breathing but not alive Was this you? And all my failures I tried to hide It was my too Until I met you Remember this moment Oh, you called my name together, and I ran out of that grave. Hey! Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. And now your mercy has saved my soul. And now your freedom is all that I know. I'm thankful for this. Oh, the old made new because of him. When I met you, oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, hey. out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. All right. This is a great word picture part of this song. All right. This is meant for, meant for, this is, I'm from Alabama. I can't do this and play at the same time. I got to say something about this. Sorry. <laughs> can't do it. I tried. Didn't go well in the first service either. Thought I could do better the second time around. Didn't happen. These word pictures, we never graduate beyond this. We, the need for rescue, I want you to imagine whenever, maybe this is still you now, imagine your sin being heavy on you, weighing you down, and there's no way you can escape from it, but God intervenes on your behalf because he loves you. Amen? That is why we are here this morning, because God did that for us. That is the story that binds us together. So we're going to, there's going to be a part where we all sing real loud. And I do not mind if you are not like a C-plus or above singer, okay? We, we're, there's no, pa this, is, this is a kind of a pass-fail, and you all pass, all right? So we're not doing any kind of grades, but whenever we get there, when I was broken, man, and I needed whatever it is after that part, it says... God was that for us. This is the story that we share. All right, I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. And I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight. This was us. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. And you 
James calls him the giver of every good and perfect gift. Father, we are here for you. We worship you now with all that we are, spirit and truth kind of people, God. That's who we want to be. So come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. The streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming songs above. The praise the mind fixed upon it. The name of God's redeeming. Our story, I was lost in utter darkness. Yeah, I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. Oh, and I was bound by all my sin. Your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a Let's read this together. Blessed is the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to be. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, here's my heart, oh, take and see. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, here's my heart. And seal, seal it for thy courts above. One more scripture from the book of Colossians. I'm going to stop playing. Let's let our voices ring out with this truth. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption. A forgiveness of sins. And I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. And I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. And now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Amen. What beautiful truths this morning. Thank you so much for singing. Would you please be seated?
Well, good morning. Welcome to the church at West Franklin. Whether you're here in the room with us today or whether you're joining us online, we're glad that you're here with us. At this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward to collect the offering. And while they do that, if you're not prepared for offering today, we can you can always do it online at westfranklinchurch.com slash give or by texting 623-623 with the word give. Uh, a few months ago, it's already moved out of the headlines, but a few months ago, uh, a flash flood hit a town called Waverly, Tennessee. In Waverly, the whole downtown was, was affected. Especially affected was a church called First Free Will Baptist Church in Waverly. They've been uh, working to bring their building back to recover what they could ever since that, that happened in August. And because of the, the connections of our church, because of the hard work of several of the men in our church and several of the men from First Free Will Baptist in Waverly, and because of the timing, God's timing, of our renovations, we're able to provide them with the pews that they need for their space. This Friday, yeah. This Friday, teams from our church and from First Free Will Baptist in Waverly came together and took the pews that they needed and delivered them there. And that, on that same Friday, the pews were already place there. You can see the renovations have been going well for them. We're grateful for that. Yeah. So just know that, that, that even in this time, we're able to be a blessing when, when stories are out of the headlines, which is exciting to me. I also want to draw your attention to something that's happening this weekend. On Saturday, there's a cultural immersion tour with a group that we like to work with called Salt Next Gen. Right here is Josh Madison. Josh, can you wave? All right, everybody get a good look at Josh there, because I'm going to in invite you after the service. I want you to go find me or come find Josh Madison and talk to him about this cultural immersion tour that's happening this Saturday. Uh, and really, as the missions minister, I love to get our people together on a plane and somewhere else, immersed in a different culture, immersed in a different faith background, sharing the gospel with people who have never heard of Christ before. But we live in a place where the nations have come to us. You don't have to get on a plane to do that. And so this Saturday, Salt Next Gen with, with members of our church and other churches are going to go together. They're going to visit places of worship uh, that are different than ours. They're going to speak with people who are who may be different from us. They're going to offer training and a special time for you to understand how to reach and equip, equip you to reach the neighbors that you have who are from the nation. So if you're interested in that, want to learn more about that, come see me or Josh afterwards, or you can go to westfranklinchurch.com slash immersion. Matt? Thank you, Josh. Good morning, church family. It's wonderful seeing you all and hearing you sing. Uh, it's just incredible. So thank you for singing and worshiping and for being here. Last week, if you were here, you'll know that I um, um, kind of named this room um, Sycamore Tree. Uh, just taking a cue from Luke 19 and Zacchaeus. This, this room's different than what we're used to, and it's going to be a season. We don't know how long this season of, of, of worshiping in here is going to be, but Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus. And so I wanted to name this room Sycamore Tree as a reminder to us that while we're here, let's look for and uh, ask for the presence of Jesus to, to dwell with us, to be with us in our midst. And so I want to continue that, that thought for just a moment, put another, another twist on it as, as I invite you to spend a few minutes in prayer with me and with one another. Um, I want to encourage you, give yourself permission to lean into the awkward, uh, to ask the Lord to give you courage to help you lean into the awkward. Um, it's awkward coming in here. Um, my cell phone went off in the first service and everybody in the room knew it. Uh, it's it's awkward, and so that may be a good reminder to you now to go ahead and go ahead and turn that off. One of the coffee pots started making a weird noise behind those curtains, and everybody in the place was looking back there, thinking we were about to blow up. So it's uh, it's it's awkward, and so I want I want us to lean in to the awkward, and to ask God for courage in that. Uh, Luke was silent in in Luke 19 about some of these things that. Zacchaeus experienced. We do know that, as the song says, he was a wee little man. But I have a real good feeling that it was awkward when he looked at that tree and thought, if I'm going to see Jesus, i got to climb up this thing. 
In first century world, men were dignified in the sense that they didn't do stuff out of the ordinary. He was a wealthy, wealthy, powerful, hated man. And I have a real good feeling he looked at that tree and thought, I don't know if I want to shimmy myself up there. But he leaned into the awkward, he climbed the tree, and I think the payoff was worth it. Not only did he see Jesus, Jesus went to his house. So what's that awkward for you? What's that thing that's like, ah, I just would rather stay down here? Where you know that if you would just lean into it, Perhaps a greater understanding of Jesus is waiting on the other side. Can I get you to bow your heads? Close your eyes. Where, where, however you're most comfortable to pray, to get with the Lord. And maybe you just simply need to say to the Lord, Lord, this is, this is weird for me. For some of you, this may be one of your first times ever at the church at West Franklin. It may be one of your first times to church. And just to walk through the doors was, was awkward for you. It's okay to acknowledge that. Maybe being in this room is awkward and you are so hoping you don't spill your coffee or elbow the person next to you. And it's just awkward. It's weird. You can hear things. Maybe, maybe you're like me and you didn't grow up in a culture, a church culture where it was normal to raise your hands in worship and to express praise to God by lifting of hands or singing real loud. Or maybe there's something compelling you to express yourself in worship that has just seemed awkward. Or maybe you simply need to say, Jesus, I don't even know what that awkward is, but whatever it is, would you bring it to my attention? Give me the courage to push through so that I can hear your voice today. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want. To experience the presence of Jesus. So take a few moments. Be real and honest with the Lord. Acknowledge the awkward. And then if you have to, climb up that tree. Let's pray together. Man, would you stand with me? The lights in here are different than last week. Last week, those back corners while we were singing, the lights were off. From the maybe the big part of the sanctuary before where you could kind of hide in the low light. There is no hiding here, as Matt said. But that's what it means to be a Christian. The lights of your soul are on, and God sees. Now, that could be one of two things. That could be absolutely terrifying, because the God of the universe sees every nook and cranny of your mind, of your heart, and he measures it against his holiness, and you'll be found wanting. Or, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and his perfect life on your behalf, in his death, and we should have died. In his resurrection to give us everlasting life. And all of a sudden, the fact that the lights are on is not so scary. In fact, it's exactly what you want because God will turn you in to Christ, to Christ's likeness. So we praise the Lord that his mercy is more than what we hide in the dark corners of our soul. 
Can we just sing about that? Amen. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. And new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Sing what love could remember. What love could remember. No wrongs we had done. Omniscient, all knowing. He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. All sins, they are many. His mercy is more. is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what patience would wait as we constantly Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weak, is the vilest, the poor. Sins they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. My riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cause. He stood neath the dead weak, never a they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, and new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. is more stronger than darkness and new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more amen In the sycamore tree, our eyes are on Jesus. We look to him, we look for him, to behold him as he is. And he who was before there was light, walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing. his throne to wake as a child and he became like the least of us behold Jesus the son of God Messiah the lamb the roaring lion oh be still
died with sinners and saints Heal the blind, the lost and the lame Even now, even now he is in our hands Behold him And he who chose a criminal's end And paid with blood to settle our debt as he rose to life Behold him, Jesus The Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring liar Oh, be still And behold him, Jesus Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him. It's a song of heaven we sing together. This simple prayer we pray together. Depend 
on you. I depend on you. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. And I'm the branch, and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. Be my strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I am yours, forever you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. depend on him till the end when I pass through death as I enter rest that's right I depend on you all the way to glory for eternal life and to be Abide, be my strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I am yours, forever you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. One of the most important prayers we have as believers are these four words. Let's end our time singing together with this prayer. I depend on you. 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 Amen. Father, my prayer for us this morning is that we depend on you. Our hands, our hearts, our minds are open to what you have for us now in this moment, Father. Help us to be all here waiting on you. Speak to us. Amen. Thank you for singing. Please see it. Thank you, Brad. Let's continue worshiping. Let me encourage you to take your copy of the scriptures if you have a copy and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. If you don't have your Bibles handy, that's okay. It'll be on the screen behind me here. Uh, if you were here last time, you'll know that we're going to spend four weeks in Philippians 4, and we started last week, so this is week two, and then God willing, two weeks following. Last week, we looked at verses 1 through 7. Today, verses 8 and 9. Paul is still addressing the issue of anxiety, how to reduce, how to remove, how to deal with anxiety, because as we saw last time, it causes a lot of interpersonal problems. 
when uh, there's anxiety and fear and worry in the heart, it drives you to having a very shallow faith, as we saw in verse 1. There's disagreement with one another, as we saw in verse 2. There's nobody, nobody wanting, to pick si or they're wanting to pick sides instead of helping people, as we saw in verse 3. Nobody's joyful because Paul has to tell them to rejoice. They're mean to each other because he has to tell them to be gentle. And so it's just ugly when there's anxiety and fear welling up in your heart. And so last week we started this verses, and this week I want to take it a verse or two, step forward by looking at verses eight and nine. So hopefully you found it. Wait, do y'all hear that? It's the coffee pot. Back to visit. It's not, uh, we're not going to blow up. It's just the coffee pot. All right, let's stand in honor of God's word and look at verses eight and nine of Philippians chapter four. Paul, inspired of the spirit of God, wrote these words to the church in Philippi. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Jesus, may the God of peace be with our spirits. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Anyone here ever play pickleball? Okay, I see one or two hands. First service, I saw a couple of hands. And then after, everybody came up to me and said, I love pickleball. But nobody wanted to admit it. I'm not going to embarrass you. Don't worry. Uh, but I'm finding, I've never played pickleball, not yet. But I'm finding that I'm one of the uh, small minorities who's not played this game. But it's, uh, pick, apparently, it's becoming a big, big deal. Probably you passed some folks playing it in a court somewhere on your way here today because it's becoming that much popular. How did I find this out? Well, I came across an article, believe it or not, in Vanity Fair. I do not read Vanity Fair, don't recommend you read Vanity Fair, but somebody passed this article along to me and I thought, okay. And the title of the article is How Pickleball Won Over Everyone from Leonardo DiCaprio to Your Grandparents. Listen to this. Between 2019 and 2020, pickleball participation grew by a staggering 21.3%. The Economist declared it the fastest growing sport in America. It's hard to make sense of that kind of growth. We could theorize as to what's behind its urging popularity or just accept the fact that pickleball is really fun and move on. The Sports and Fitness Industry Association estimates that 4.2 million Americans play at least once a year. That's roughly the number of people in this country who play lacrosse and ice hockey combined. It's also comparable to the population of Oregon and greater than that of 23 other states. Schools across the nation are adding pickleball to their phys ed curriculums and the stage is set for a vibrant youth movement in years to come. Here comes pickleball. <laughs> now, the article was asking the question, why is this so popular? Why is it taking off this way? And so they asked an avid player. Her name is Simone Jardim, 41-year-old mother of two and savage destroyer of anyone challenging her position as the top-ranked women's player. She ascribes pickleball's ability to bring different classes together to its humble roots in public venues. On the same court, you can have a millionaire with someone living paycheck to paycheck, she explains. No one's interested in what you do for a living, only in how long you've been playing. There's an egalitarianism to pickleball you don't often find in other sports. This person says, I've gotten whooped by men and women in their 60s, and I've beaten friends with private jets and cur current college athletes, and I regularly swap pickleball-related texts with a former U.S. president, an Australian rocker, and a buddy who jumps the New York City subway turnstiles to save cash. Now, I thought this was very interesting on a host of levels. My mind's just weird that way. But when you ask the question... Why are so many people playing this game? And probably there's a lot of people in Williamson County playing on Sunday morning while we're here. Why? Well, according to this person, for a little while they get to turn off the noise and go play. For just a little while they get to give themselves permission and not worry about somebody's political stance not worry about somebody's opinion on something, not worried about how much or how little money they make, 
not worried about the color of their skin. The only thing they're worried about is how long you've been playing. And that probably seems refreshing to them to be able to turn it off, go, play, and have a good time for a little while. It sounds refreshing to me. I don't know if I'll take up pickleball or not, but I'm all about turning off the noise and actually going into enjoy things for a moment. Why do I start this way? Well, I don't want to push this too far. But when I read Philippians 4, 8, I see Paul pleading with the church to say, give yourself permission to turn off the noise and dwell on that which is beautiful. He's pleading for the church to say, stop focusing on the ugly and the negative. Go to the streams of living water. Focus on the things that are true and beautiful and praiseworthy and honorable, lovely. He's saying, he's saying it's okay to turn that off. And he's inviting us to say, all right, all right, I've got to force my mind on that which is glorious. And if you believe that Jesus is the king of the kingdom of heaven, then hopefully you believe that Jesus is at work on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe, just maybe, the kingdom of heaven is happening right under your nose. But because we're not focused on these, we're ignoring the kingdom. I've heard... I've heard Philippians 4.8. I've preached it this way, and I've heard it preached to me that Philippians 4.8 is the ultimate TV guide. Whatever is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things, dwell on these things, count on these things, reckon these things. I'm like, well, I ain't ever watching TV then. I don't know if it's a TV guide. I think there's media at play here, which we'll get to in just a minute. But Paul didn't have a TV. The Philippians didn't have Netflix. They couldn't go and binge watch shows. They couldn't do that. So Paul's not saying, every time you turn on the TV, you need to use Philippians 4.8. I don't think he's saying that. But he did have people that he pastored that knew how to complain. He did have people that he pastored that knew how to look at their glass half empty. He did, he did know that people that he pastored focused on the ugly, the angry, the fear, the fury. And now he's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give you and your church permission to ignore the noise, not put your head in the sand, but notice even in the midst of the ashes, there's beauty. That the kingdom of heaven actually is right under your nose if you'll just see it. So he gives eight words. Eight words in verse 8 tells us to dwell on, to think on, to count, to reckon. And I, I think some of them he's just making up just to, just to try to get it out. It's a conglomeration of words to say, think this way, not that. But he lists them there. Look, he says the first one, true. Think on that which is true. It means genuine or reliable. He uses it 24. It's found 24 times in the New Testament. He uses the word honorable. Dwell on that which is honorable. It means noble or respectful. He, that's found four times in the New Testament. The word just he gives. He says dwell on that which is just. It means righteous, to be right with God. He liked this one. It's used 79 times in the New Testament. He says think on that which is pure, blameless, innocent. He, that's found eight times in the New Testament. Why do I bring up all these times because these next two are important. He says, think on that which is lovely, pleasing, acceptable. That's the only time that word is found throughout all of the New Testament. Paul is grabbing for words saying, it's, you gravitate towards the negative. I'm going to call on you to focus on the glorious and the beauty and the goodness of God. He says the same thing with commendable. Focus on that which, dwell on that which is um, um, admirable. Again, only time you see it throughout the New Testament is is right here in Philippians 4.8. He says, focus on that which is morally excellent. That means goodness, gracious acts of God, and reliable. That's found five times in the New Testament, but it's the only time Paul uses this word is in Philippians 4.8. And finally, he says, I want you to dwell on that which is praiseworthy, that which is laudable, commendable. And as you see there, it's found 10 times. Why does he do that? He's saying, you anxious? You worried? You full of fear? Where's your mind? 
What are you looking for? Are you looking for the kingdom of heaven that's come to earth that's in your midst? Or are you looking for everything out there that could get you? He's putting everything together to say, just give yourself permission to turn it off and look for what God's doing right under your nose. I love the way Eugene Peterson uh, puts this verse in his translation of the message. He describes Philippians 4, 8 this way. He says, I'd say, quotes Paul in his translation saying, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. I love that. Yes. You know what's not on this list of things to dwell on? Think about it. Division. Opinions. Arguing. Fear. Fury. Things that are outside of your control. That's not on this list. But can I ask you, where's your mind been? What do you dwell on? You know why Paul tells us we have to do this, right? Because our automatic default mode is to do the other. You've scrolled Facebook. You know how easy it is. There's a whole reason Twitter exists, and that's to make us mad. That's the reason it is still around on the planet, is to make middle-aged men like me angry. I'm not middle-aged yet. That's about 10 more years. I'm <laughs> but seriously, think about it. If you want influence on social media, do not write anything true, noble, righteous, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Don't do it. You won't get any traction. Nobody wants to read that junk. To them, it's junk. If you want to get traction on social media, be ugly counteract and say, that's not true. Here's what's true. Start a fight on Facebook. That'll get some traction. You want people to share your stuff or like your stuff? Throw out your opinion. <laughs> the reason Paul tells us to dwell on these things is because it's easy to dwell on the negative. It's easy to get angry. It's easier to get fearful. And none of those things that he, he, he talks about do we, do we spend hardly any time doing. I don't think we even recognize it. Look at, what he, look at what he does there in verse 9. Look at what he does. Paul is, um, well, you, you know Paul. He, it seems arrogant that he would say this, but it's true and it's kind of scary. Verse 9, he says, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. You want peace? Paul says, do what I do. The God of peace will be with you if you just do what I say, listen to what I say, uh, watch me, just, just do what I do. And you know what I think he's saying? I know what I'm talking about, Philippians. This isn't just some hokey, positive thinking, self-help stuff that's going to fix you for 10 minutes and then you're going to be back to your... This is the nitty-gritty stuff of life. Paul's saying, if anybody, if anybody had reason to complain, it would be me. It's only by the grace of God, Paul could say, I'm not a crotchety old man who gets mad at everything, gets mad at everybody because I've been kicked out of churches, I've been beaten, I've been told to leave towns, but you have followed me and you know that I chose to dwell on the fact that the kingdom of heaven is right under my nose and that's where my mind has been. This isn't a put your head in the sand and forget the ugly that's around. This is a choosing to look for the beauty that's in the ashes. Now, how can we begin to move in this direction? How can we begin to move towards thinking this way as opposed, and as opposed to living in anxiety and fear that seems to dominate? Let me give you three challenges and then we're done. Three challenges and then we're done. Challenge number one, pay attention to the media you consume. Pay attention to the media you do consume. What I mean, there's a couple things I mean by that, but be critical. 
Be absolutely critical with your brain and your heart with what you allow yourself to watch and or scroll through. I'm not saying stop. I'm not saying cut it out. It's not what I'm saying. I think that'd be impossible virtually. But I'm saying pay attention to it and be critical with it. What do I mean? On the one hand, pay attention to what it's, what's stirring up in you when you watch certain things. Is it, is it leading you to understand more of what's true, noble, righteous, pure? Or is it compelling you to things that's causing more angst or causing more darkness? For instance, some of us in this room could, some of you could, in this room could, could watch a show where a spouse cheats on another spouse and it do nothing to you. Others of you may watch the exact same show or the exact same movie and there may be major issues in your marriage and that may be the catalyst that pushes you to go do the same thing with your spouse. Pay attention to what's happening in you as you watch because you know that's not of God. Some of you could watch a show and it have rampant drug use in it and it not affect you at all. Others of you could watch the exact same show and you see this drug use happening and you even know it's wrong and the show is, com is, is putting it out there is wrong, but you know that, that that's what the one thing that, that sends you into a tailspin. Pay attention to what's happening in you as you watch. Give, give credence to that. Okay, how is this, how, what is it, is this, is this leading me towards, some, towards what, what God says or is it leading me away from doing what God says? Um, it, it's, not just, it's not just paying attention to how you're being compelled, but be critical with what's actually happened in a show. There are times I, have watched, I will watch a show and I'm thinking the Bible's coming to life right in front of my eyes. And I'm not talking about the chosen. That's literally the Bible. Coming. I'm, talking, I'm talking about something else. For instance, uh, a couple weeks ago, I watched the pilot of a show called Succession. I couldn't watch the follow-up shows because the language was really bad. And my mind works in such a way that if I hear a certain amount of words, I'll think and say them. And I'm a preacher, and I don't need to say bad words. And, so, and also, it costs to get episodes two through the rest of the... So, <laughs> I mean, full, full disclosure, but, I, but I'm telling you, I, I, watched, I watched the pilot, and I, and I thought Prover, Proverbs 15, 17 is just happening right in front of my face. It's about this angry millionaire man who has kids that hate one another and are trying to jockey for his money when he dies and for his company this most dysfunctional family. And it's obvious that man has raised his family with one thing in mind, and that is more power and more, that's two things, more power and more money. And I thought Proverbs 15, 17 says, it's better a little and vegetables where there's love than the fattened calf where there's hatred. Or my translation, it's better with bologna and cereal where there's love than filet mignon, where there's hatred. And I thought, Pearson, pay attention to the people under your roof. Because the Bible says if you, if, if, if you pursue these things, you're going to have a dysfunctional family. And I saw it right in front of my face. There's sometimes the, the, the media can t teach us that sin does have consequences. You know, I love sports and Last week, the Las Vegas Raiders got some more horrific news. They've had a bad year. And one of their star receivers, Henry Ruggs, was let go from the team this week because he was doing a lot of things he shouldn't have been doing, driving 156 miles an hour. That's one under the influence, weapons, that kind of thing. Ended up killing some folks in a car. And the media was just having a field day with Henry Ruggs. Field day, as you can imagine. They put a microphone in the, quarterback's, in the quarterback's face, Derek Carr, the quarterback for the, um, the Las Vegas Raiders. And they said, what do you think about Ruggs? What do you think about him? And you know what Derek Carr said? I don't know if he's a believer. I hear he is. He said, that, I love Henry Ruggs. And that man needs love more than anybody right now. And if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to love him. I read that and I thought, that's the gospel. Because there are times everything in my life says guilty. 
And I wonder if there's anybody that's going to take a risk. And Jesus says, I love him. Yes. Be critical with what you watch. How is it true, noble, righteous, pure? You get it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the second thing is be disciplined to step away from media more and more. Be disciplined to step away from media more and more. I can't tell you, I can't tell myself in this, in this culture that we live in to turn it off. I can tell us we can be disciplined with it. And I can say the reason I put this up here is because I believe it is almost impossible, if not completely impossible, to do Philippians 4.8 with your eyes on a screen all the time. It is very, very difficult to obey Philippians 4.8 when your eyes are on a screen all the time. You say, well, how much is too much? I don't know. That's not, that, I, I can't say. That's above my pay grade. You pay me a three or four million more, we'll talk. <laughs> but I don't know. You do know, don't you, that there are human beings made in the image of God that are waiting to have conversation. Oftentimes, I think we think the kingdom of heaven is some huge, dramatic kapow. But I wonder sometimes if the kingdom of heaven is right here or across the table from someone in your home and you're missing it. There's somebody wanting you to be curious and find out more about them. And there's somebody for you to love. There's creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies declare his handiwork. Do you know we live in one of the most beautiful states on the planet? I hadn't been to many places, but I've been to Arkansas. <laughs> I have. Did you know Jesus addresses anxiety in Matthew 6? middle of the Sermon on the Mount, there's some people that were anxious, and he goes, here's how you deal with your anxiety. Get this. This is what he says. Become a bird watcher. You say, well, that's for old people. No. Jesus says, be a bird watcher. He says, you're anxious? Consider the birds. Consider them. You say, why would I consider them? Because they're worth a lot less than we are in the eyes of the kingdom of heaven, and guess whose needs are taken care of? Birds. Right in the middle of nowhere, you know what they find? A worm. And you know what they're always doing? Singing. Always. I've never had a bird come gripe at me. They just sing. Jesus says, consider the birds. And then he also says, watch weeds. He didn't say, go watch the flowers that you plant in your garden, though I encourage you to do that. He goes, consider the, uh, the flowers in the field. Those are weeds. Have you ever stopped to look at a weed? They're purple, they're red, they're yellow, they're green, they're orange, they're magnificent. Maybe the next time you're at a red light, don't pick up your phone to see who just texted you. Roll down your window and look at a weed. <laughs> you know what it's going to do? It's going to remind you that the king of the kingdom is alive and well and everything's going to be okay. We live in Middle Tennessee and right now the trees are showing off. They're crying, glory. It's insane. And they're only going to be around a few more days. Let me encourage you to turn off your devices. Get permission and leave work early. Go by Starbucks and get a whole milk pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> and ask for extra whipped cream. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's magic. And take the long way home. God has given us a gift in Middle Tennessee. Not so you can be some green tree hugger uh, granola person. That's not what I'm saying. Although I love granola. I like mine with chocolate chips. Bring them by. But I, what I mean is, church, listen. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. And there are times we need to turn off the news and get scared and look at the king of the kingdom who was on display and saying, I promise I got this. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right.
Last thing. Find a model to imitate. Paul says, whatever you've seen in me, heard from me, learned from me, watched from me, you were with me for a while, Philippians. You, you do those things, and the God of peace will be with you. That is a bold statement to make. What does that mean for us? We can't watch Paul. It means you and I need to find somebody that when we're with them, our blood pressure goes down. Find somebody in your life. They don't talk about the kingdom of God. It's where they are. They don't necessarily say Jesus all the time, but he's oozing in and around him, them. Find someone whom you know exudes this dwelling and this peace and learn from them. You say, I don't know who that could be. Ask God to show you. You may need to start in books. Eugene Peterson does it for me. Wynn Collier, the music of Andrew Peterson. Find a model and imitate. That's what Paul said do, and the peace of God will be with you. Brad, would you come back up? We're going to close with a with a song. I do think sometimes, if not all the time, that one of the reasons we are an anxious, fearful people is because we believe a false narrative. We believe the false narrative that I'm sure Henry Ruggs is believing. We're gospel people. That's why we're here. But we, we do something again. We mess up again. And we think, I got to fix it. I got to fix it. I got I to gotta do this again and again or do it better this time so God will love me. There's a reason Paul said the first word there is true. Because if your default mode is to try to fix your sin, you're living a false narrative. What's true is God already did everything necessary to fix you. And maybe we need to live out of that. Jesus, would you help us to dwell on these things? To recognize when we don't. And to dwell on these things that are good and beautiful and lovely. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then just stand with me. We'll end our time together singing Philippians 4.8. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, moon full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go straight, leaving in the light of his glory and grace. Once more. God bless you. See you next week.